from going to medical school um, when I had this massive change of heart, had a bit of an epiphany, a bit of a breakdown, whatever you would want to call it. But I that I was going to medicine I was going to be financially secure. So I was Sandeep, your voice is breaking in between. There's a slight lag. 15 years from now. Hello, Sandeep. Okay. There's a slight lag. Uh, see if you can turn off your video and continue. Give us one minute. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, we'll just re resume shortly. Sorry about this, folks. He's just joining us. He's disconnecting and reconnecting. Just give us one minute. Joining in 30 seconds. Uh, meanwhile, please feel free to introduce yourself at the chat window. Just tell us where you're from, what's your name, what you do. Uh, it'd be a nice opportunity for us to get to know each other.
All right, folks, I'm incredibly sorry about that. Is this a little bit better? Yeah, Sandeep, this is much better. Thank you. Yeah. Like, about that. Let me start over. Um, not the best. Um, I'm going to start over from the beginning. Um, my name is Sandeep. I was born and raised in the US. Um, and as I was saying a few minutes ago, I actually grew up 100% convinced that I was going to do everything but go into to education. I would have told you there was no way I was going to become a teacher growing up. Um, and I, as I got a little bit older, I was a couple of months away from actually taking a big decision, which was to go to medical school. I'd already been accepted into medical school. And I had this bit of an epiphany, a breakdown, whatever you want to call it, but it was this realization that I was doing medicine for all of the wrong reasons. Um, I realized that I was doing medicine because I wanted to make a lot of money. I realized that I was going to do medicine because my parents had told me it was the right thing to do, but I did not want to do it for the reason of wanting to make the world a better place. And I had a bit of a conversation with myself and I said, who's the type of person I want to be when I look in the mirror 50 years from now? And I realized that on the path that I was on, that was not the type of person I was going to become. And so a bit on a whim, I actually joined this program called Teach for America, where I taught for two years in a low income school in Washington, DC. So I taught seventh and eighth grade science in Washington, DC, um, had an incredible experience, had an experience that was incredibly challenging. I taught kids that came from environments and backgrounds that were tough, kids that were exposed to everything from gang violence to all sorts of stuff. Um, and those experiences, they shook me. Um, and they also showed me that this was the work that I really wanted to be doing. And so a few months after I got done teaching, I actually jumped on a plane and flew to India where I came to help get Teach for India off the ground. Um, and that's where I've been for the past 11 years. I've been working with Teach for India, serving in a number of different roles but working to basically build this organization and to try to, to build our fellowship program. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Really excited to jump in with all of you and talk about some of what we've learned through these stories. Um, before I do though, I actually would love to be able to turn this over to all of you. And I see several of you using the chat box, introducing yourself, talking about where you're from. I'd actually love to start us off with a, with a question, which is this word, this phrase, grace sunshine. Um, and my big question for all of you is when you think of the phrase grace sunshine, I'm curious to know what that means to you. Um, so what does grace sunshine mean to you? It could be, this is the image that I think of when I think of grace sunshine. It could be, this is the first word that comes to mind. What does gray sunshine mean to you? What's the first image, the first word that comes to mind when you think of the words gray sunshine? Go over to the chat box. We're gonna take about five minutes in the chat box just answering this question. Would love to hear from as many of you as we possibly can. I think we have about 40 folks on this call. Um, would love to see 40 responses. Um, and we're gonna take the next five minutes and then we'll come back together. So Sandeep, we've already uh, started getting a couple of responses on the chat window. Uh, Amandeep uh, says, Grace Sunshine Forum means ray of hope. Uh, Prerna Bharatwaj uh, says it means hope again for her. Um, we we'll wait to hear from more participants on what does the phrase Grace Sunshine mean. Binsi says, hopes in time of dark, times of darkness for me. Uh, Praniti says, sunshine in the middle of, this, of a storm. Great. Loving the responses that are here. Um, thank you for that, Ashwat. Would love to see some more. Just take the next three or four minutes. What's the phrase mean to you?
we have leya kumar who says it's light in the darkness uh, akeeb for akeeb gray sunshine is light after darkness that was from a long time uh, again request other participants if you feel comfortable to unmute yourself uh, and share what does gray sunshine mean to you please feel free to do that else please use the uh -huh. chat window uh, but sandeep i'm seeing a lot of responses which look uh, uh, talk about uh, difficult times and hope coming together <clears throat> Really appreciating the responses here. Thank you for all of these. Gonna give it just one or two more minutes um, just for other folks to, to, to share what's on your mind. Uh, we have Sanjana who shared that for her it's bittersweet. Uh, it makes her think of dark chocolate. It might not taste the best, but sometimes it's good for you. Uh, Pooja, uh, we have uh, Nikita who has said that it's a ray of hope uh, and the gray a ray of hope in the gray around you and moving towards it. Uh, we have Nutan who talks about uh, it's hope with darkness from dawn to dusk. Um, Margarita Kamoyan who says it's chal every challenge itself is a success and that's what uh, this person is associated with the phrase. <clears throat> okay, let's give about 30 more seconds. If you still haven't responded uh, to the question, please take the next 20 seconds to respond to it. What does the phrase gray sunshine mean, for you, mean to you? All right, thank you so much for all these, loving some of these responses. I mean, um, I'm gonna try to take the next few minutes and try to illustrate um, what it means to me. Um, and my hope is that over the next few minutes, you're able to discover what this means and, and through that, you're able to discover really what's unpacked in this book. So I'm gonna introduce you to a few people that I met along the way as I was writing this book. And, and one of them is a child named Malini. Um, and so Malini actually lives in, in Govandi. And Govandi is one of the largest slum communities in Bombay. Um, and Govandi, for, for those of you that don't know a lot about it, right? It's a, not only is it one of the largest slum communities, but it has statistics that in many ways are, are mind numbing it has levels of poverty that you really wouldn't find in most places in the city. It has a life expectancy of 39 years of age compared to 67 years of age for the rest of, for the rest of India. Um, it has an apothecary, so it has a chemist um, for every 10,000 people, whereas the rest of India, you have a chemist for every 1,000 people. It has levels of disease and poverty that parallel what you would find only in sub-Saharan Africa. And this community, well, it sits next to this giant landfill called the Dionar landfill, right? And this landfill is basically where all of the city's trash just gets dumped. And so you've got this giant slum community that sits next to this enormous landfill that just collects the city of Mumbai's trash. And as I was writing this, I spent several days just chatting with people, kids, parents of this community. And as I was trying to find people to talk to, several teachers pointed me to this girl named Malini. And everybody kept saying, you have to talk to Malini, you have to talk to Malini. And she's one of our favorite kids. And I, and I sat down with this child and I started to talk to her. And as I'm talking to her, you realize why people want you to speak to her. She just has this smile that lights up the room. She, within the first couple of minutes, starts talking to you about Finding Nemo. She starts talking about how The Boy in the Striped Pajamas is one of her favorite books. She starts telling you about the cartoons she loves to watch. And she's 15 years old. And she's got this way of making you feel just really warm and really at ease. And so I'm sitting here, I'm talking to Malini, and a few minutes into the conversation, she says, hey, 
do you want to come and meet my mom? And so I start walking with Malini towards her house and, you know, we, we, we leave the school and we're walking through Govandi. And the way that Govandi is structured is the closer you actually get to this landfill, the cheaper your rent is. And the farther away you live from the landfill, well, the more expensive your rent is. And so you've got residents living about a half a kilometer away from the landfill and they're paying several thousand rupees per month. And you've got residents that live right next to the landfill and they're paying two or 300 rupees a month. And so we're walking through these winding lanes of, of Govandi and we get to Malini's house. And Malini's house is about 200 meters away from the DNR landfill. And so she's got this tin shed constructed house and inside the tin sheds, you've got pieces of plastic and trash that are actually just figuring out how to keep the monsoon rain out. And so we walk into her house and her mother's sitting there. And so her mother cuts cardboard boxes for a living and her dad is a rag picker in the landfill. And her mother starts to talk to me and her mother, you know, starts talking to me about Malini and she looks at me and she says, you know, these teachers of Malini, well, they keep coming to me and they keep talking to me about college. And all of them keep saying, you know, we want Malini to go to college. We want Malini to go to college. And, and Malini has been with Teach for India now for the past seven or eight years. And, you know, she's gotten an education to where she's going to go to college next year. And she looks at me and she says, you know, I want to believe them, but at the same time, I don't know if I can believe them. And I look back at her and I say, well, why can't you believe them? What would be, what would be wrong with that? What would be wrong with her going to college? And she snaps back at me and she says, listen, you know, these people, they keep coming and they keep talking about college. But she says, look at my condition and look at where I am right now. And she says, I know that you're sitting in my house and you're probably judging my house. But if you were to know what we have been through before we moved into this house, you would realize that we are lucky to even be here. You would realize that we are lucky to even be alive. And she looks at me and she says, you know, if you would have seen what we've been through over the past two decades, you would realize that it is a privilege for my husband to even be picking rags in that landfill. And she looks at me again and she pauses this time. And she says, listen, I wake up every single morning and I do one thing. I pray for a blessing. I pray for a blessing because I realize that is the only thing that is going to get me through this day. So these teachers, these fellows, they can be talking to me about college, but that's not what's gonna get me through this day. I walked out of Malini's house that evening, folks, thinking about all that her mom shared and all that she shared. And I walked out very honestly, heavy. And I walked out heavy because I was thinking about the fact that the only thing that could possibly account for Malini's states it's just the deep oppression that she goes through. The oppression and the inequity that she has experienced for years on end. And so that's Molly. I want you to meet Asif. And Asif is a child that basically was, was showing me around this community. And he is this 16 year old child who is now in college. And he has probably the best manners I've ever seen in a child. He's the kind of child that's walking around with you and, and he's the kind of child that refuses to go first wherever you're walking. He insists that you go in front of him. He's the kind of child that will open every single door before you go in. He's the kind of child that will never interrupt you and will always make sure that you feel comfortable. And so Asif and I are, are walking around and we just leave Malini's house because he's been with me this whole time. And he can see that I'm starting to look a little bit heavy and he looks over at me and he says, you know, Sandeep, why are you feeling so heavy? Like, what's wrong? Like, why are you not, what's wrong? And I, and I, and I look at him and I said, I don't know. But I said, I have a question for you. And I said, if you could basically take a magical ticket 
And that magical ticket would get you into any single school in this city. Where would you go? And he looks back at me and he thinks for a second. He says, you know, if I had a magical ticket, I think I'd probably go to Bandra. And I was like, why Bandra? He says, well, if I had a magical ticket, that's easy. Well, I'd go to the Ambani school because the Ambani school is where it's all at. The Ambani school is where all of the rich kids are and that's where I'd love to be. And I looked at him and I said, you know, don't you think it's a little bit unfair that what's differentiating you from the kids in Bandra is that it's money. And he looks back at me with this look like I'm just crazy. And he says, don't you understand somebody? Everything in India runs on money. Why would education be any different? Folks, I walked out of that community thinking about inequity. I walked out of that community thinking about oppression and I walked out of that community thinking that inequity and oppression are so interlinked with kids that come from impoverished backgrounds. And here's the question I'd love to be able to pose back at you. From your experience, and I am cognizant, I've gone through a lot of your responses. We have a lot of educators on this call. From your experience, what's the impact of inequity on education? And what do you see as the linkage between these two? I'd love for us to go back over to the chat box for the next five minutes. What is the impact of inequity on education? Thank you, Sandeep, for sharing those two uh, stories. Uh, um, folks, the participants, the question for you is from your experience, what has been the impact of inequity on education? Like, What has been the impact of uh, unfair, unjust education? Uh, please use the chat window to share your responses, and then we'll move forward from there. We already have one response uh, from Prerna who says that it leads to social instability. Would like like to uh, hear from others as well. Again, the question is from your experience, what's the impact of inequity on education? What's the impact of an unfair and unjust education? We have more responses coming in, Sandeep. We have Vineet Ayer who's saying it widens all the existing gaps that are there. I think he's referring to both economic learning, social. Uh, we have Akib who said that the talent of the deserving kids does not get a strong platform as many others would get. <clears throat> we have Chanke Kumar who says it leads to an imbalance in education. Uh, Praniti is sharing that it leads to a society where we will continue to be unequal as education would be an equalizer. <clears throat> really Thank you so much for all of you for sharing that. Let's give it about one or two more minutes. Thank you for those of you that kind of sharing some of these. Really interesting to see some of these responses. Would love to hear from some of the others on the call. Yeah, very interesting responses are coming in. We have Elia Kumar who says it's about lack of access to opportunity and structure. Uh, Amandeep is sharing its uh, unequal distribution of resources. Uh, Shambhavi is uh, suggesting about the bad conditions on host on for students and their future. Um, Sunil is talking about the uh, the divide that we see currently around let be social, economic, digital. <clears throat> Give it about sixty seconds more. Really interesting to see some of these. 
yeah very interesting uh, response here we have ekta who's talking about looking at the current scenario the inability uh, the inability to dialogue with each other uh, um, i think that's result uh, according to a result of an unequal education because people don't know what is a fact and what isn't mukta says it's denial of opportunities abdul says it leads to emotional instability lack of unlocking of potential okay so we'll leave it over for about 30 seconds more as you're typing your responses please do take the time to go through others responses as well uh and hope so spark something within you as your but come up okay folks thank you for all of these uh again a lot of interesting responses and as they continue to to roll in we're just going to we're going to try to move forward um a few minutes ago i asked you what what gray sunshine means to you um and i'm going to tell you what it means to me um i think gray sunshine to me is rooted in the realization that for the vast majority of india's kids our country's children are are living in the greenness they are the malanis and the asifs and they are living so deeply in the greenness and the truth is is that amidst that greenness there are rays of sunshine there are people who are doing some incredible work there are kids like malani and asif who have so many assets so many things that they bring to the table but the truth is is that those rays of sunshine never really shine fully they're always checkered with grayness and i think that's what malani showed me and that's what malani's mom showed me is that the sun never really shines fully and as of today it's not shining fully folks these stories are symptomatic of something much larger we live in a country right now ladies and gentlemen where we have 76% of kids dropping out we get sense we have less than 10% of kids actually making it to college we live in a country where we have more than 50% of kids in grade 5 that can't read a grade 2 text more than 50% of kids in grade 5 that can't recognize simple division problems we have statistics that define our education system right now that are simply mind numbing and a lot of people ask me well why did i write this book like what was it that drove me to write this book and the truth is is that i've been working with kids in india for the past 11 11 and a half years and what i have come to realize more than anything else is that underlying these statistics are human faces underlying these statistics are stories of kids whose futures are at stake underlying these statistics are human lives that could not be more real i wrote this book folks to really try to make sure that we get those stories out there to try to get people to see and to connect with the human faces that are not that different from anyone else that are underlying all of these statistics I'm going to turn this over to you one final time before we actually open this up to a Q&A. And this is a question that I've actually been grappling with a lot. And it's a question that our teams that teach for India like have been grappling with a lot. And it's so we know that there's a lot of inequity. We know that there's a lot of poverty. What I'm telling you right now isn't 
different. But the real question is, how do you actually tackle an educational system that is so rooted in inequity? When you are serving kids, 320 million kids, the vast majority of whom come from impoverished backgrounds, how do you tackle an educational system that big? And I guess the question I'd love to ask you is, what's the kind of education we need to be giving our kids to empower them to climb out of poverty? And that's the question I'd really leave to you for the next five minutes. What's the kind of education we need to be giving our kids to help them climb out of poverty? Some people might argue, actually, it's a lot of academics. Some people might argue, actually, no, we need to be doing a lot more than academics. To get kids to rise out of poverty, we need to be giving them a whole host of other things. I guess my big question is, what's the bet that you would make? We're going to take about five minutes. Go back to the chat box. As I should mentioned earlier, as you're back in the chat box, what I'd love for you to be doing is looking at other responses, build off of those responses, and then I'm going to close this out with one final piece, and we're going to open this up for questions and try to hear from folks. Thank you, Sandeep. Those are uh, the statistic around that only 10 out of 100 students go to college to complete it was really shocking. Um, Again, uh, participants, the question is back at you. Uh, what is the kind of education we believe that our kids deserve? Uh, please take some time to fill in uh, in the chat box. I know some of you had uh, sent in your responses as part of the registration form as well. Please take the time to share those responses again here on the chat box. Um, we've already got Chanki Kumar and Shambhavi sharing their responses where they talk about how it has to be full of equity. Equity educators and teachers must know how to use their resources. Um, uh, Shambhavi is talking about how it has to be based around practical knowledge. That's the kind of uh, education she believes that the kids uh, uh, need. Akib is talking about how education is like a gate pass to your career and for economic mobility, uh, and which means that restricting education only to grades and scores is not uh, is uh, is what happens, and hence skills and knowledge is being given less importance, including values as well. <clears throat> These are really interesting responses in the chat window. I hope others are taking the time to go through it as they're sharing theirs as well. Really interesting responses. Let's leave this open for another minute or so. Thank you for all of these responses. A lot of diversity in the responses here. Um, would encourage you just to check out other responses as you're, as you're typing yours as well. If some of you want to elaborate further, please feel free to unmute and share your thoughts as well. Uh, it'll help others understand what is it exactly you're sharing on in the chat window as well. Uh, hello, Ajwat. Yes, hello. Yeah, I'm yeah. This is Ilay Kumar from Tamil Nadu. Hello, Ilay Kumar. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's very good that I'm being with you, that I'm happy. So here the, like, we can understand the question that, uh, you know, the inequity, which is mentioning the, as well as the 
you know kind of a class which uh, somebody else discuss in the financial issues okay both the caste and class plays a major role especially we are having the inequality part okay so here the kind of education what we need is like uh, always we will be discussing about whether it is a torals as a report we will cross check the quality of education but here the problem is if the first generation student comes in then they cannot able to do you know complete uh, all the steps which we are giving as a education like it, it i'm starting it from a completing a assignment like if for example what i have experienced myself is my father is a farmer so i will do support him when he is in the farm field i cannot take book back and i cannot do any kind of homework steps yeah so on the entry level you know like from nowadays you can we can see that lkg itself we have a entrance exams just to screen yeah. people if at all you are having money also you cannot get the seats that's true yeah exams. so in the same with all the universities everywhere so like uh, it is quite you no know, uh, true thing is if at all they don't know they nothing will come to them also we have to give them education that once we have to admit them yeah Oh, inside the education institution, then we have to teach them education. It's not. I'm not telling about the education which will give them a job. So yeah. job. If they need job, then they can go for any kind of training. But education is the stuff. This thing is like they have never experienced from the generation generation. Like for example, my grandfather's education is zero. My mm. father went to school up to second standard. So it may take some three four generation for me to. Yeah. Know, we unsettle the stumps yeah. so, very valid point kale yeah. kumar thanks so much that's so yeah thanks thanks yeah, yeah. Um, so sandeep just to quickly summarize he spoke about how class how caste how for being a first generation learner how affor affordability even if you're a bright student and clear entrance exams right from lkg all of them have uh, played a role uh, uh, in his experience and how are the education probably his grandfather had or didn't have is very different from what's the education he needs and probably his kids as well we <clears throat> is getting yeah. a lot of interesting responses in the chat window as well sandeep such valid thoughts there so thank you for sharing that for those of you going over to the chat box thank you for sharing these as well um i'm going to tell you what i believe and and that's that this is a debate that we need to be having this is a discussion that we need to be having um and i think that's that what is it that kids need to actually leave our schools with greater opportunity and it is that discussion that is going to get us there is that debate that's going to get us there i'm going to close with just one final story and then i'm going to open this up for questions and some of the data that i just showed you a few minutes ago was from this report called the usa report which many of you may have heard of and it's it's sponsored by a company called Pratham an organization called Pratham and and I want you to meet somebody named Anurag okay Anurag was actually a, a teach for India fellow so he taught for 2 years in a low income private school in Delhi and about a year into his teaching experience anurag came to school and he planned a whole lesson where he really wanted to introduce his kids to the usa report and he wanted to basically teach his kids about the inequity in education that exists across india and so he brings this usa report into his school and he starts showing his kids the statistics and the kids start asking they say anurag this isn't you know where is this data coming from and he said well it's coming mostly from rural india And so his kids said, "Well, don't you have data from our community?" And Anurag kind of looked at him and he said, "Actually, the truth is that I don't." And so his kids shot back and they said, "But you're showing us data from India and you're expecting us to basically try to talk about our community, but you don't actually know what the data is in our community." And Anurag paused and he said, "You know, you're right. Actually, I don't know what." what the condition is in our community here in Delhi and and so he actually turned that around into a challenge for his kids and he said well what if we were actually to go out and collect that data right here in our community and so his kids basically spent the next several weeks learning what they needed to do to figure out how to actually become proper researchers 
And so they learned all about survey methodology. They learned all about what it means to collect data. They studied the methodology that Pratham and the USA report uses. They studied the methodology that other organizations use. And these were six standard kits. And after a few weeks of studying and basically immersing themselves in the methodology, they eventually went out and they started surveying all the kids that they could find from the community. And they started using the same USER assessment where they were testing mathematics and literacy. And they started collecting all of that data. And after a few weeks, they had gathered data from several hundred kids in the community. And they came back and they compiled all that data. And what they found was that the data was actually no better than what the ESSA report found. And so as you can imagine, his kids got really angry and they said, we need to figure out how to do something about this. And so his kids over the next several weeks ended up figuring out how to start forming everything from tutoring camps to one-on-one -on -one mentorship with other kids to after school classes where you actually had kids teaching kids from the community how to read how to form mathematics, how to get better at academics. And I mentioned this story as a closing story because when I think about the type of education we need to be giving our kids, I think this is it for me. I think it's the kind of education that empowers our kids to better understand their communities, but the type of education that empowers our kids how to figure out how to do something about what they see how to solve the problems that they come across. Nice. Folks, we at Teach for India run an organization where we believe two big things. One, we believe that every single job deserves an excellent education, and that is what we're trying to figure out how to do. We also believe that in order to do that, we want to figure out how to build a movement of leaders, leaders like Anurag, who are working relentlessly to eliminate educational inequity across the country. Right now we have about a thousand of these fellows serving about 32,000 kids um, and they're working to do just that. They're working to figure out how do you give kids an education that will fundamentally transform the lives of our kids. I'm gonna pause now. I'm gonna open this up for questions. I know several questions came in before I got the chance to go through those. Thank you for all of those. Um, we just love to open it up. When you think about all that you've just heard, what are questions that come to mind um, Ashwath, I'm going to let you maybe anchor this next piece and then we'll just pick a few questions. So what are key questions that are on your mind? Um, maybe take a minute or two, um, go back over to the chat box one final time and then we'll maybe just call on some folks and try to spend a few minutes holding space. Yeah. Thank you, Sandeep. Thanks so much uh, for sharing that story about Anurag. Uh, so participants, uh, again, this is back uh, for questions, more questions from your side. So Sandeep started off uh, uh, by talking about what does gray sunshine mean for each one of us uh, and why is that an analogy he's drawing to the education system with the stories of Malini and Asif. Uh, and then with that, uh, we spoke about, uh, all of us shared what is the kind of education we believe our children need. Uh, and he used an example of Anurag Kundu to see how he built that awareness among his students uh, on the learning levels in their community and what is it they can do to find that and to address that issue. So bringing in student voice and agency. Uh, now we are, the, uh, uh, it's the floor is again open to you. If you have questions that you have for Sandeep, you have questions um, you know, uh, around anything that's been discussed that you would like to ask, please feel free to put it on the chat window or ask Sandeep directly. Uh, meanwhile, a uh, lot of interesting responses are coming in the chat window. Please keep that conversation going on uh, do read others uh, responses as well and share your thoughts on that. We have around five minutes time for questions and answers for uh, uh, participants. So please feel free to ask any question that you have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello, hello, Ashwad. I'm, I'm in Leia. Yeah, again. Yeah. yeah. So I have a question to Sandeep, right? Uh, like, uh, you know, now the new education policy draft has been, uh, you know, published. So we, we state that, you know, kind of uh, public examinations for the school school kids, you know, like which we have in the RT to the eight that it state that you know, up till eight standard, the students can be passed, but 
now the government is coming with new kind of skill based education which have you know uh, fifth and eighth they have a separate public examination so i need to ask that sardeep rai that how it will increase uh, like what kind of effort it, how it will affect the you know inequality gap in the education like how, how it will be trouble for the people to access education that's what i want to ask it can be a comment on it can be a comment yeah. on uh, new education policy also yeah. yeah so i'm just trying to summarize your question so based on the new education policy that's coming uh, and the fact that they're thinking about uh, 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 testing at different grades is that what you said uh, what will what do you think could public be the impacts in yeah, yeah. Public, public examinations, examinations that are there. What do you think is the impact of of these uh, with the in the education the, system, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Sandeep, do you want to uh, uh, take that question? Yeah, I mean, my overall take, folks, is that I don't think that examinations in and of themselves are bad things. I think it depends on what we do with those examinations, and I think that's what it's going to determine a lot. If those examinations are used for wider detentions. I think it can have a very negative impact and perpetuate inequity. But I think if we're able to use examinations to learn and to understand basically how we can better serve kids, I think examinations can be hugely helpful. I think the problem that we have in India is that oftentimes we end up using assessments purely as evaluative and judgmental tools. And that's what I think 100% fuels inequity. But I, I think the big question that I'm grappling with is how do we move, how do we not get rid of examinations and look at assessments as the bad things, but say, actually, we need to change how we use our assessments to help us get better. And that's, I think, the fundamental shift. And so I just want to clarify that. I think the assessments in and of themselves aren't bad. It's, it's how we're using them. And that's what's basically perpetuating inequity. Thanks, Sandeep. Uh, we have one more question from uh, Nikita. Uh, she would like to know that while working with students, what is what kind of resistance did you face from the kids? Uh, Nikita, could you clarify actually? Do you mean while I was writing the book or do you mean overall at Teach for India while we've been working with and serving kids? Um, which of those do you mean? Yeah, I think, interestingly enough, we've actually been quite, quite fortunate. Um, I think what we have found overwhelmingly in the thousands of classrooms that we've served in over the past 11 years is that the vast majority of kids that we've worked with are coming to school really wanting to learn. Um, the vast majority of kids that we have worked with are coming to school really hungry to learn. Um, and I think because we start with kids as they get into primary grades, I think we found that most often. As our kids have gotten older, of course, we face all of the challenges that come with adolescence. Um, and I think that's probably where we started to see a little bit more resistance. And that's where we started to face issues of investment and issues of really wondering whether or not school matters. But the truth is, is that Whenever we've started working with kids, I think the vast majority of kids that we've worked with have been, have been really invested in education. Um, I think underlying that, I would just add one more piece, which is just that like underlying that, I think is always a little bit of jadedness, a little bit of cynicism, a little bit of will school really matter for me and will school really make a difference for me? Um, but yeah. Thanks, Sandeep. Uh, I also want to be cognizant of the time. We just have two minutes uh, remaining. So I'm just taking one final question. Post that. Uh, participants, if you have questions, we'll share Sandeep's email address. Feel free to write to him uh, or write to contact Firki and we will make sure we get a response and we share it back with you. Uh, so I want to build off uh, the last question with what Akib has shared in terms of how does one stick to their commitment in spite of all the odds and he's talking in the context uh, of the fellowship but I guess for other teachers as well uh, in this uh, webinar today uh, 
we know teaching is difficult. We know teaching is uh, sometimes very tiring, uh, especially if you're teaching first generation learners, the kind of expertise that's required, the kind of preparation that's required is so, uh, is so different and it's very difficult. So in spite of all these odds, how does a teacher stay committed? How does a teacher stay motivated? Uh, if you have any suggestions or tips on that. Yeah. So I remember the first day I walked into a classroom, I actually had a desk thrown at me. Um, and the desk almost hit me. And then I had a child charge at me. And I remember thinking post that day, there's just no way that I can do this. And the number of times that thought came back to me was probably in the dozens for my first six months. And I came back to that thought every single time I, you know, came up to a tough situation. Every single time I came face to face with the inequity my kids faced. And I'll tell you what I think kept me through it. And I think I'm gonna share my example because I think there's a similar strain with our fellows and with all teachers. And I think it was reminding myself of two things. One is that what my kids were facing was exponentially worse than what I was going through in that classroom. And two, is that the last thing that my kids needed was another adult that could walk out on them. And I think because of my recognition of that, I think it kept me going. I think over time, what fueled that was realizing that my kids had so much potential. And I think that's actually what keeps me here today, is the recognition that underlying all of the struggle underlying all of the inequity, underlying all of the challenges that come with that are the immense assets that our kids bring to the table, the immense potential our kids bring to the table. Um, and that's what I would say more than anything else is the recognition of that potential. Thanks, Sandeep. Uh, that's quite interesting. I'm sure a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, participants probably resonate with what you've just shared. Um, we just want to be cognizant of time. It's past uh, one minute past 7.30. So we are coming to an end to this webinar. Uh, Sandeep's email address is mentioned in the chat window. So if you have further questions, if you want to talk to him more, know more about his journey and uh, his experience, please write to him directly. Uh, the stories that today Sandeep shared of Malni, Asif and Anurag are the stories uh, that's from the book that he's written, Grace and Shan. I've just pasted the link of that book uh, where you can purchase the book. Would definitely recommend all of you to uh, try reading this book. It uh, talks to you. Uh, it talks about the stories of children and teachers and what are the day-to-day -day struggles and what, what does it take to you know, provide an excellent education. I personally found these stories to help me connect with the ground reality. It also helped me be motivated in the work that I do. And so I would definitely recommend that. Uh, Sandeep, work, as he mentioned, he works with Teach for India and Teach for India runs a fellowship program. If you're interested in joining that fellowship program, uh, I would request you to follow the uh, link that's been mentioned in the chat window uh, to just know about, uh, about it. Uh, before we close out, uh, participants request you to drop in a word or a, a couple of words on what has been your biggest takeaway learnings from the last 60 minutes. Uh, and while you do that, Sandeep, uh, if you could share just how, what's been your experience of this webinar, how has the last 60 minutes been for you? Really good to be here, folks. I, I think that seeing so many of these responses in the chat box are really what's pushing me. Um, I think seeing just the different interpretations of what's gonna give kids an excellent education. And again, I think it's that debate and that discussion um, that we really need to be having. So thank you so much for, for sharing all those insights. Ashwati, you're on mute. Oh, thanks, Sandeep. Uh, thanks for sharing that. We already have Shambhavi, who's uh, mentioned in the chat window that she wants to read the book. I've pasted the link in case you want to buy the book from Amazon. The link is provided. Um, again, uh, if you have any further questions, please feel free to write to Sandeep. His email address is provided in the chat window. 
uh, thank you again for taking the time this evening and joining us for this conversation around India's education system and how it is symbolic of a grey sunshine. Uh, and thank you so much for being engaging and sharing your thoughts. Uh, I feel I've learned as much from the speaker as from uh, the responses that I've seen in the chat window. Uh, so thank you so much, everyone, for doing that. Uh, and uh, stay tuned and you'll hear from us uh, soon on the next webinar. Uh, just before we close out, just want to share uh, uh, the winners uh, from the registration. Uh, if you remember, we had uh, asked in the registration form, like, what is your understanding of an excellent education? And we said three participants uh, will uh, have an opportunity to get a copy of the book. Uh, what we saw is we found a lot of interesting responses from the participants. So I'm just going to take 30 seconds quickly to share that, uh, who our winners are and also uh, share um, uh, a little bit. Uh, also, we saw that there were a few other responses which were quite good and we wanted to have a special mention. Uh, so one of, the uh, one of the first winners is Dinsi here, uh, who shared uh, uh, their experience, their understanding of an education system, education system in other countries. I'll take 10 seconds. To The second winner uh, of the book, Grey Sunshine, we have Akib here, uh, who shared uh, their understanding again of the education system. Um, please take a few seconds to uh, uh, go through it. And third, we have Vineet Iyer, uh, who's also used an interesting metaphor of a railway crossing to talk about the current status of the education system and the different structures and people who are involved in it. Binsi, Akib and Vineet, uh, uh, somebody from the Firki team will reach out to you separately uh, to make sure that the book is couriered to your uh, postal address. Uh, we also had, in fact, a lot of participants had very interesting responses. So here are our special mentions for whom uh, we are planning to give a Firki merchandise. Uh, we have Pooja Verma's response. <clears throat> Sunil Kumar Jain. Nutan Aya. A very interesting point Nutan has made about the different boards and curriculums that we have. Yeah. So Nutan, Sunil, and Pooja. Uh, please again look out, you'll have somebody from the Firki team reaching out to you uh, and you'll be uh, getting some surprise uh, uh, goodies from our side. Uh, again, thank you everyone for joining us. We hope you have a uh, wonderful evening. Uh, good night. Bye. Thank you, Sandeep.